Hey everyone, the name is Eric Thorne. Today we're talking the big five and personal development for the 16 personality types. So I developed the big five personality test. The big five, also called Ocean, is a model of personality and personality psychology. It's one of the three most popular systems known globally. The big five is said to be the most scientific and focuses on what is the most visible and the most easy to observe in human behavior, focusing on five primary scales, outgoingness, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. The big five measures and studies your personality based on how you tend to act and how you tend to behave. Now, I believe the Big Five is probably the best model to apply if you're looking for personal development. So not personal growth, but personal development. If you're trying to improve yourself in some way, for example, become more outgoing, more friendly, or more conscientious, the Big Five is the best tool to use to better and to understand where you currently are on a <laughs> global scale. What the Big Five does really good is it gets strong statistics and consistent results. So you can use the Big Five to understand a lot about yourself. Now, in today's video, I want to discuss how you can improve yourself and what you might want to improve in yourself from a Big Five perspective. To get started, I recommend you take my Big Five personality test. And I will link to this, to this personality test in the description down below. So I recommend you check out this Big Five test now and take that test and you see those results first. So what you want to do is find out your scales first. Find out how extroverted you are as opposed to how reserved you are. Now, okay, assuming you've got your ocean scores right now, Let's look at personal development. Something I see is a lot of people are looking to be more outgoing. What that means, it might mean that you become better at going out, meeting new people, you perhaps attend more workshops, you perhaps work on getting involved in some kind of community organization. You do something that will help you get more into the world around you, more engaged, more active. Perhaps you take up jogging, perhaps you go out Perhaps you start uh, initiating more friendships and perhaps you start talking more to people at work. Perhaps you uh, might tell yourself, oh, I'm going to talk to at least one person at work today or, oh, I'm going to try to befriend that person or I'm going to try to get to know this person a little better. You set like these small goals that can nudge you to become a little bit more outgoing by finding small ways that you can get to know people and become more social. Another thing you might want to look at is learning to become more reserved. And now, why would you do that? Well, being on the extreme end of extroversion, there can be a lot of negative side effects. All that social interaction and all those things happening around you might distract you from working on yourself or taking time for yourself or for in to introspect or to re yeah, really just check in with yourself and your emotional health. People that are too extroverted might become too prone to risks and they might... Uh, jump in too fast into something, they might speak without thinking or they might make more mistakes. So if you're an extrovert, you might benefit from developing and learning to be more cautious in certain situations, taking more time before you make a decision, uh, learning to fact check before you go into an idea or a project, learning to look at and think about consequences before you do something. You might also just want to do some practical things like set aside some time in a day to just be yourself and to be with yourself, to take a bath, to relax, to unwind. Because sometimes, even for an extrovert, social interaction can be very, very draining. If you're looking to develop openness, things you might want to try is just going to a museum or going to a movie or a documentary. It might be, for example... Uh, exploring some political viewpoint that's different to yours and trying to learn to see different sides and perspectives. People that are more open, they are more prone to changing their minds. And so a person that is too high in openness might want to benefit from becoming a bit more skeptical. And what that might mean is try to set a routine for yourself. Try to form some base habits to keep your life stable and structured. Perhaps look into... Uh, really finishing a project before you start up a new one or perhaps uh, try to see an opinion to the end test it and see if it works even if it's a new idea opens up and it seems more interesting give your previous beliefs some time and check with yourself how they work and uh, basically 
just check in with yourself and with other people before you commit to some new project or a new idea. When you're looking at agreeableness, agreeableness is a scale of basically how be good you are at cooperating with other people or how difficult you find it to get along with other people. Often people that are very high on agreeableness can have the reverse problem of sometimes being pushovers or struggling to speak out for themselves. A person who is too agreeable might want to benefit from finding ways to say no and to set healthy boundaries for themselves. A person that is too low on agreeableness might instead want to look at small things they can do to uh, support other people around them or to help the people who need it or to befriend others around them. Small things you can do to show that you care about other people or that you like them or that you find them to be positive or important. Giving people some time, trying to be a bit more patient with people, even if at the beginning it sounds like, no, this is not going to work out. Just trying to see ways to make it work together with others. Because a lot of time, conflict can be bridged and you can find ways to connect with other people, even if it sounds like in the beginning it's impossible. Conscientiousness is a big one and it refers to how organized you are. I'm a person that is uh, trying to learn to be more organized and it might sound weird that uh, a judging personality type in the Myers-Briggs system might need to be more organized and for me it's just about getting healthy focus. As a judging type I could benefit from having more focus in my life and dealing with distractions. So I'm learning to set goals for myself and to stick to goals and I'm learning to not scatter myself too thin around other people and tasks and to-do lists to just give myself time and to not uh, say yes to too many things. I'm also learning to be more relaxed and uh, that might uh, sound contradictory to a high conscientiousness score but I can overwork myself and uh, forget to enjoy life and what I do. So I am also learning to be less conscientiousness, less conscientious in a sense that I'm learning to give myself a break and to not push myself too hard and to learn to schedule in fun and to just do things for myself. So I'm seeing already ways that I can be more conscientious and ways where I can be less conscientious, ways where I can be more open and times when I can be more careful or cautious, times when I can show more skepticism or critical thinking and times when I can show more positive thinking or optimism. I tend to be a very optimistic person, sometimes too optimistic. So sometimes I have some small rules for myself. Whatever I think is the best case scenario, I should always scale it down by 20%. So if I have a high ambitious projection for what I think will happen, always turn it down a little bit because things happen that you can't anticipate. Things don't always roll out perfectly. So uh, don't get too optimistic when setting goals or planning for things because that will also lead to bad or poor planning. Finally, the last, perhaps most important score to look at is your neuroticism score. Neuroticism is a measure of how anxious you tend to be or how much you experience worry or difficulty or stress in life. So a person that is very stressed or very anxious will have very high neuroticism. They might worry more than other people. They might worry about more things than most people. They might take on more uh, things and struggles than what other people do. They might dwell more on struggles than other people do. So. A person that has high neuroticism might benefit from meditation, relaxation, yoga and all kinds of strategies and techniques that can help you get and become more mindful of life. It can also include like uh, being more present in life, in what you do, being more aware of your actions and what's happening to you and your feelings, recognizing when you're being anxious or recognizing stress or recognizing struggles and uh, being able to look at it from an outsider's perspective, not getting stuck inside a feeling or a negative feeling or not constantly going over a scenario, but recognizing when you're starting to become obsessive or when you're starting to become unhealthy in a thinking pattern or an action. Now, the last question I want to leave of all of you is, is there a bad thing about not being neurotic? Is there a problem with being too emotionally stable or being too relaxed or not being stressed enough about a situation? Are there times where neurotic types are beneficial to the group or the workplace or society? I believe that yes, if you are too relaxed or if you are 
taking things too easy or if you experience too little worry, that might be a sign of not setting enough challenge for yourself. So a person that doesn't challenge themselves, doesn't push themselves, doesn't set goals for themselves, doesn't have anything higher to strive for, this person might be less neurotic, but they might also experience less passion and motivation in life. So neuroticism might also be a side effect of caring too much or having too difficult goals in life. What I believe is we should work with a difficulty level idea. So imagine how difficult your life is for you right now. Is it too easy? Is it average? Or is it too difficult? Try to keep your difficulty slightly above average, but not too high. Try to keep things from becoming too hard for yourself. Try to scale back and not push yourself too much. but do set healthy challenges for yourself. Try to note this when your difficult level is too easy because that will inevitably lead to boredom or struggles with motivation. And that can also lead to less happiness and less joy in life overall. So that was my video about the big five. Now, I don't believe the big five is a superior system to Myers-Briggs type indicator or the Enneagram. I simply believe it's a different one. It has a lot of strong correlations to the Myers-Briggs but these correlations are not complete, so even if um, certain MBTI types might have certain big five scores, the pattern is not 100%, so these systems don't overlap completely. Similarly, there are patterns between all systems, and all systems look at different things. The Myers-Briggs looks at a person's primary passions and values in life. The big five looks at the person's social behavior in a group. The Enneagram looks at personal beliefs and emotional struggles and patterns that you have since your childhood. So every system can be used for different things. Let me know in the comments down below what scores did you get? What are you working on in yourself right now? Did you have any surprises when you took the big five test? And what are you looking to improve in or benefit from? in the future in 2020. Thanks for watching and see you all in the next video.